440 million years ago, the Earth was a very different place. Life was confined mostly to the seas and dominated by bizarre creatures such as sea scorpions the size of a human and very primitive fish and multitudinous trilobites and cephalopods that lived in large conical shells. Now, if you were there at that time, you might have thought, well, this is it. This is how the Earth will always be. After all, these creatures have existed in these forms for tens of millions of years. But the continents, they were drifting. And as they drifted south, the Earth began to get cooler, and the snow and ice began to pile up. And a climate crisis dried out the Earth's productive shallow seas resulting in the first mass extinction since there's been complex life on Earth, wiping out 85% of species. Life rebounded in the Silurian and Devonian period. Now we have the first forest colonizing the shores, and our ancestors, the Sarcopterygian fish, they evolve limbs and they crawl out from the sea. But again, a bad combination of bad atmospheric chemistry and bad ocean chemistry cause a climate crisis, and we lose 75% of species. But life, as they, weigh, as they say, finds a way. Uh, and in the Carboniferous period and in the Permian period, forests abound, coal swamps form, and the progenitors of all dinosaurs and all birds on one side and all mammals on the other side separate and go down their own evolutionary pathways. But those continents, they're still drifting, and they bump into each other, forming the supercontinent of Pangaea. On large continents, climates are extreme. And when all the organisms can be in contact with all the other organisms, they all have to compete with each other. And it's hard on life. And then the Earth opens up in what is now Siberia. Giant volcanic fissures issuing forth vast quantities of greenhouse gases. And the planet overheats and causes the worst extinction ever. We call it the Great Dying. In the ocean, 70% of species go extinct on land. 96% of species go extinct. Complex life on planet Earth is almost snuffed out in this moment. Following this, we have the Triassic period, this depauperate, post-apocalyptic world. It's a really hard place. This is where dinosaurs evolve, into this world. And at first, they're small and can menace nothing larger than a bug. But those volcanic fissures, they have another pulse of eruption, despoiling the atmosphere once again, causing another climate-induced mass extinction, and this time we lose 75% of species. Now, in the Jurassic period, the, the world of the dinosaurs really begins in earnest. Dinosaurs get huge by the Cretaceous. They're on every landmass and in every imaginable environment. Now, when paleontologists first recognized dinosaurs around the, the mid-portion of the 19th century, well, they could see that they were here at a certain point, they persisted for some interval, and then poof, they were gone. And nobody had any idea why. So humans did what humans do. When we don't know something, they made stuff up, right? <laughs> and so there were all these now seemingly crazy crackpot theories about what happened to the dinosaurs. For example, maybe sex determination in dinosaurs was temperature dependent, and it got too hot to make males or too cold to make females. Or Maybe our sneaky little shrew-like ancestors, maybe the mammals ate all their eggs. Or this was a prevalent idea among 19th century scientists. Maybe they were just too dumb to live. Maybe they died of their own indolent nature and failure to adapt, an idea known as species senescence. Maybe they were like humans. Maybe they just ran down over time and perished. Or my favorite published scientific idea, what happened to the dinosaurs, maybe caterpillars ate all the fiber-rich plants and the dinosaurs, they perished of constipation. <laughs> published paper. <laughs> and then in 1980, another idea was hatched, an extraterrestrial cause for the extinction of the dinosaurs. And honestly, that sounded a little wacky too, didn't it? But it was based on hard science. It was based on sedimentary strata outside of Gubbio, Italy, where Luis and Walter Alvarez went. And they found a clay layer that matched the end of the time of the dinosaurs. And they analyzed the elemental composition of this layer and saw that it was abundant in the platinum element 
iridium, which is common in asteroids, but very rare in the crust of the Earth. So they hypothesized that an asteroid, or perhaps a comet, took out the dinosaurs. So a worldwide search starts for this impact layer. And the layer itself has been found in over 350 spots around the world, but precious few fossils have been found in that layer. In Poland, there's a mosasaur vertebra and a single tooth. In Missouri, a, single, a, a similar occurrence. In Belgium, some fish scales. And now in North Dakota, there's a site that has produced a pile of paddlefish and a dinosaur leg. And I myself began to look for this place, for this layer. And I looked in North Africa and in Patagonia and the, the foothills of the Himalayas and in the Gobi Desert and Montana and Wyoming. And I finally found a place that I was looking for in this quarry behind a shopping center in New Jersey. a place where, he, where we have been working diligently for the last 12 years, excavating meter by meter. It's taken us 12 years to process just 120 square meters of this space. And in that space, we have collected and cataloged over 100,000 fossils, representing over 100 species. So now we're beginning to really understand the details of this cataclysm that wipes out the dinosaurs, mostly through a drilling project that occurred a few years ago off the coast of Mexico through the crater itself. And so we now know that the asteroid, it probably hit in the springtime because of the pollen trapped in the gills of fossil fish. We think that the asteroid was about 18 kilometers across, a carbonaceous chondrite that approached the impact site from the northeast at an angle of about 50 degrees, blasting a 180-kilometer crater in the Earth's crust. Now, if you were at our site in New Jersey at the moment, you wouldn't think anything was amiss. You're too far to see the impact itself. But eight minutes and 23 seconds later, a magnitude 10.3 earthquake rips through the place, knocking large dinosaurs to the ground, breaking trees, tearing hillsides from the landscape. And then all that debris blasted out of the crater, a huge volume of material. It's pulverized to maybe millimeter-sized pieces, but it flies up into space. And now it's got to come back down. And when it comes back down, it's got to balance the energy books. And how does it do that? Mostly by friction with the atmosphere. Imagine that day, trillions upon trillions of millimeter-sized space capsules, each one flaming back into the atmosphere, each one heating up a little parcel of air around itself. And the result is that that day, globally, temperatures get up to somewhere in the range of toaster oven to pizza oven. At our site in New Jersey, 17 minutes after the asteroid hits is when the sky falls. After 165 million years of dominating terrestrial ecosystems, the dinosaurs would have not one day more in New Jersey not more than 17 minutes. It's absolutely shocking. Two hours after this, an incredible heat blast rips through the area, knocking down 90% of remaining trees. And then all that dust and gas in the atmosphere, it, it, oh. and then uh, eight hours later, a 42-foot tsunami breaks on the coast, grabbing the scorched bodies and the broken trees and the land and pulling them back out to sea. And then all that dust and gas in the atmosphere blocks out the sun, causing photosynthesis to cease. So now in the ocean, with the base of the marine food chain kicked out from under it, those effects ripple up really fast. And pretty soon, the world can no longer support the insatiable gluttony of things like mosasaurs and plesiosaurs. So we really have two parallel mass extinctions, one on land, mostly because of the heat, one in the ocean, mostly because of starvation. And then the Earth remains cold and dim for a protracted period of time in this asteroid winter. This precipitates the world's fifth mass extinction, a climate crisis kicked off by an asteroid impact, taking out the dinosaurs and 75% of species and really paving the world for the modern world as we know it even the way for the modern world as we know it. 
So this is a site, we think, worth preserving and a story worth telling. So about 12 years ago, I partnered with the community to begin to uh, look for pathways to explain this site. Um, two amazing individuals, Gene and Rick Edelman, stepped up and made a, a tremendous contribution to the project, which really kicked off our museum development. So last November, uh, we broke ground on a 42,000 square foot, $73 million museum at this site. And this museum will be dedicated to understanding the world's fifth mass extinction and the unfolding biodiversity crisis, and will feature the dinosaurs that existed on the east coast of North America at the end of the Cretaceous period, and all the major kinds were there, and the sea creatures that existed on the property in a layer that will literally be beneath the visitor's feet. Now, there are a lot of things that I love about this project, but two of my favorite are these. When we open the doors next year, we will have geothermal energy and solar energy, and the building has been very sensibly designed and constructed, and we will be New Jersey's largest carbon net zero building. Thank you. And we did it with off-the-shelf technology. It's nothing special. Anyone could do this if they have the will. The other thing I really love about this project is that above that layer that we manage and curate very carefully, there are sedimentary deposits along the walls of the quarry that still have lots of fossils in them from just after the age of the dinosaurs. And we can let the public go in and collect fossils for themselves. And every person, every kid, every grown-up who goes there who's not afraid to get their hands dirty, who tries a little bit, finds a 65-million-year-old fossil with their own hands that they get to take home. And we've seen over and over that's just a transformational experience, especially for kids. When they make that connection between themselves and the Earth's ancient past and the place where they live, it's life-changing. And that little clam or that little shark tooth that they find with their own hands that becomes more important to them than all the T-Rex in all the museums of the world because they get that it's an authentic experience. They really appreciate the authenticity of this. When they find that little fossil, they're the first humans to ever see that. They're the first human to ever know that. It's a real discovery. They become an authentic explorer at that moment, and it's empowering. It's addicting. In the process, we're inculcating them with a scientific method, a way to receive and process information in a rational way. And boy, do we need that, need that today, right? Um, so why do we study the ancient past? Because that's where the answers are. That's where the data lie. When you think of it, the present is the smallest wisp of time. The sentence I'm speaking now is already in your past. And the future, well, we don't have access to the future. The future is like a dark scrim, always racing before us, always concealing how the world will dispose of our hopes and dreams and prayers and desires. But the past, the past is real. You can touch it. You can pick it up. You can crack it open. You can study it. You can put it in a museum for all to see. And if you take the time, to learn the language of the rocks. The rocks, they will start to talk back to you. And wherever you go in the world, they will start to whisper. And they whisper the same thing they always say. It didn't have to be this way. It didn't have to be this particular way. At any point in history, there are an infinite number of futures that we could have had. Nudge a space rock there. Reorder an event there. A single sunbeam causing a single mutation is all that it takes to change the course of all that is yet to be. It's all so contingent. And we have been the beneficiaries of this amazing stack of past futures that led to this particular reality. And now, we're using our atmosphere as a garbage can. In the last 800,000 years, atmospheric CO2 has never breached 300 parts per million. Not when the common ancestor of Homo sapiens and Neanderthals existed. Not when we split from our kin and went our own separate ways. Not when Neanderthals went extinct 50,000 years ago. Not most likely when your country was founded. But now, in the last few decades, 
this is what's happening. That's not a mistake in my chart. That's the brick wall that we are all facing today. And that combined with habitat destruction is wreaking havoc on the planet. The United Nations estimates that a species goes extinct once every 20 minutes. During this talk, it's probable that a species that has had an unbroken chain of ancestry back to its 3.8 billion year microbial forebears will go extinct. If you look at large animals, vertebrate creatures, well, over the last two, two million years, the background rate of extinction has been nine species per century. Well, in the last 100 years, we've lost nine species, plus these, plus these, and these. We are propagating the world's sixth mass extinction. And now we know, through, through paleontology and through geology, that the previous five were all caused by climate crises. The last one, a climate crisis induced by an asteroid impact. Well, now we are the asteroid. But we don't have to be. There's still time to act to avoid the worst of it. Will we heed the urgent dispatches from the fossil record that tell us that we are not the recipients of some cosmic proclamation of manifest destiny? We got lucky. Will we listen to the urgent whispers of the rock record that warn us that the Earth does not need us? Far from it. The Earth has mostly not had us, but that we need the Earth. We live on a little, rocky, easy-to-damage, lonely lifeboat in space. There is no planet B. There's not going to be a planet B. All we have, and all we will ever have to guide our way into the future, is each other and the past. What's next is up to us. Thank you.